Thank you, Seth. And we are continuing in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 13, which is the longest lesson the Lord taught in the Gospel of Mark. It's the Olivet Discourse, named for the Mount of Olives, where the Lord sat down after leaving Jerusalem and gave a lesson to the disciples on the end times, the signs of His coming. And He has given so far in our coverage of this passage the general signs of the present age. But now with verse 14, and we'll look at verses 14 through 27, He looks more specifically at the, uh, the end of the age. And we read, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it may not happen in winter. For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom He chose... He shortened the days. And, when, and then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or behold, He is there, do not believe Him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then He will send forth the angels and will gather together His elect from the four winds from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. <clears throat> May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. I read a short story about the village idiot of the shtetl of Frampol. A shtetl is a Jewish village. The simple man was given the job of waiting at the village gate for the arrival of the Messiah. The pay wasn't great, he was told, but the work was steady. It's a bit of humor that masks hope that has been disappointed so often that it has drained away. The work is steady because the Messiah never comes. Uh, We know He uh, has come. Uh, Our hope is His return. Behold, He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see Him. But that has been mocked by the world since the days of the apostles. In fact, Peter spoke of that, spoke of the doubters in 2 Peter chapter 3. Where is the promise of His coming, they said. Things continue on as they always have from the beginning. The Messiah never comes. It's an empty hope. And a lot of time has gone by. 2,000 years have passed since the Lord left. So the world's cynicism may seem a bit justified to us and might even wear down the hope of the church. But then this is exactly what the Lord said would happen. When he sat down on the Mount of Olives, he told the disciples that the end would not come immediately. A lot of things would happen. A lot of time would pass before that happens, before the Lord returns and establishes his kingdom. 
In addition to all of the calamities that he describes, there would be ministry, though. Ministry in the midst of all of it. The gospel would go out. It would be preached throughout the world. So, so they were not to be deceived. That's one of the main emphases that the Lord has, has laid in this lesson. And at the same time, they were not to lose hope. They would be mocked. They would be persecuted, Jesus said. But he told them in verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So be patient. Be hopeful. Persevere. The one who said all of this is the Lord. He rules history. He has a plan for this world and for his people. He revealed that plan in this chapter. How far along is the plan? Where are we on the prophetic clock? Well, who knows? But after 2,000 years, maybe we are at the end of the beginning. Maybe the end is near. When it is near, God's people will know it. They will see some specific things that uh, will happen. And in verse 14, the uh, Lord gives one sign of the end, the abomination of desolation. He said this abomination or this blasphemy would be standing where it should not be. In Matthew, he gave a, a more exact location for this. It would be standing in the holy place. What's the holy place? Well, that's the temple, which is right across from him as he's giving this sermon, this lesson on the Mount of Olives. They're looking at this splendid temple that would be destroyed, but that's the holy place. So his prophecy is based here on the book of Daniel, where this expression abomination is used three times. In Daniel 9.27, an abomination is prophesied to happen when a future prince will put a stop to sacrifice. Uh, that is explained in more detail in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31 with a prophecy about a ruler who will desecrate the sanctuary and set up the abomination of desolation. Now, many interpret that to be a prophecy of the Syrian ruler Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived 400 years after the prophecy of Daniel was given. Uh, others believe it is a prophecy of one who is still yet to come. But certainly Antiochus and his actions, if not the fulfillment of that, do illustrate from history what will occur in the future. Antiochus viciously persecuted the Jewish people and tried to stop sacrifices in the temple by slaughtering a pig on the altar. And then he set up an altar, uh, rather a statue of Zeus in the sanctuary. And that corresponds to what Paul speaks of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4, where he makes a reference to a person he calls the man of lawlessness who takes his seat in the temple of God. Paul connects that event with the day of the Lord. So it is still future and happens in what must be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. John describes it in Revelation 13 verses 11 through 15 and how an image of the beast, the Antichrist, will be set up and people, the people of the earth, will be made to worship it. That is the abomination of desolation. Calamity will follow, but the Lord's people are to pay special attention to it. Let the reader understand, the Lord says. The reason given is that when the events happen, those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, let me kind of pause for a moment because not all who interpret this, and I'm speaking of good, solid commentators, understand this to be something in the future. Some interpret it as referring to the events of A.D. 70 when 
the Christians of Jerusalem fled to the uh, town of Pella, which is east of the Jordan River. Uh, they interpreted, they interpret these commentators, the abomination of desolation to be the Roman army surrounding the city. And Luke does speak of that in uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. But what is described here is something that happens inside the temple, not outside of the city. It is advice that's given to future believers, the the church has been raptured. This is about the second coming. And so this is teaching that is given for the saints of the tribulation. And it is a signal to them, the Lord says, that they're to flee for their lives. The Lord gives special incentive for that in verses 15 and 16 where he says the flight should be immediate. No one should go back to the city if they're outside of it to get their possessions. And he, he shows special concern here for women, particularly those who are pregnant or nursing children. The, the moment will be very dangerous and escape will be urgent. The reason for the urgency is given in verse 19 where the Lord describes these events as uh, a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of creation which God created until now and never will. The destruction of Jerusalem in, in AD 70 was a uh, colossal catastrophe. According to Josephus, over a million died in the siege and nearly 100,000 Jews were taken prisoner and sold off into slavery. Josephus may have inflated his figures. He is notorious for exaggerating. But even so, the number killed and taken as slaves was huge. It was without question a great disaster for the nation. But still, as bad as it was, it's hard to see how it was worse than disasters that have been fallen, befallen the Jews since then. After all, the Nazis surpassed anything the Romans did by killing six million Jews. But also the events of AD 70 were, not, were no worse than those that happened 65 years later in the year 135 when Rome crushed the Bar Kokhba revolt. I think I mentioned that last week. The Roman historian Cassius Dio wrote about that and wrote that nearly a thousand villages were destroyed, 600,000 Jews were killed in battles, and those who died in famine, fire, and disease, he said, were past finding out. The, the Roman legions virtually wiped out the Jewish population in Palestine, raised Jerusalem to the ground, and they built a Roman city on top of it named Aelia Capitolina and dedicated the city to the god Jupiter. Now, all of this is to say the Lord is not in this passage describing the events of A.D. 70. Events comparable to and worse than that have happened since then. He's describing something that is yet to come, which will be far worse. It's the tribulation. And the Lord said in verse 20 that it will be so horrific, so destructive, that unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But it will be cut short, he says, for the sake of the elect, the ones he chose. He will intervene on their behalf at some time and at the right time. He does that. He always knows what is happening and he takes care of his people in every place and in every age. This is a statement he's giving here for the future and for his saints in the future. And he's giving them warning and direction. But, but what he does then, he does now. He does for us. As I said, in every age. And in that day, though, he will cut short those evil days for their welfare. Again, the Lord is in control and working everything according to his plan. So we are to know his plan that he reveals here and we're to trust it. 
Trust the scriptures and not imposters. Now, this is a very practical passage. It's not just a, a passage that's interesting for us because it speaks of the future and events that are going to come. That's very important and it's very interesting, but it is a practical lesson that he's giving because he's setting forth the future and events and how they will take place in part to say, don't be taken in by the things that people say today or in the future. Don't be taken in by imposters. And there will be many of those in the last days, he's saying, but he's already said there'll be many of those in the present age as well. So again, he gives a warning not to be gullible. Don't be taken in by people who claim to have some special knowledge about the end times or special knowledge about the Messiah. Clever people will come along claiming to have that. They have, they will. In fact, the Lord says in verse 22 that they will be able to do signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. I think he's probably referring here specifically to the beast and the false prophet of Revelation 13, the Antichrist and his lieutenant at the end of the age, they will do counterfeit miracles, lying wonders as the apostle describes it, be very effective in, in their, uh, their, the deeds that they do, and uh, uh, lure a lot of people into their, their trap. The Lord indicates just how effective they will be when he says here in verse 22, they could lead astray, if possible, the elect. If the elect could be misled, even they would be. That's how effective these false prophets will be, or these, I think, particularly the beast and the false prophet. But they won't be led astray. So as, as sobering as this statement is, and it's intended to be a sobering statement, it's even more encouraging than that because it is not impossible. It is not possible, I should say, to lead the elect astray. All but the elect will be misled, but election preserves the Lord's people. And perhaps I should put that a little differently. Election is the basis for the protection. The protection will come through the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse, 20, verse 30 that, that he has sealed our hearts for the day of redemption. He, has in, he is within the genuine child of God. Every one of us has the Spirit of God. He's a seal upon us. And he does many things. He enlightens our minds. He teaches us. He guides us. But he keeps us faithful. And it will keep the elect faithful. Now that doesn't mean that the elect aren't ever gullible. They can be. They often are. Jesus warned the disciples in this lesson in verse 5. Be, see to it that no one misleads you. Why is he saying that? Because we're often misled. He said in verse 9, be on your guard. Because it's dangerous in the world. There are deceivers there and they're very clever. So you must be alert to that. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the apostle wrote, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Not all are. Not everyone who speaks about the Bible or speaks about Christ or speaks about the gospel is genuine and speaks the truth. Error, when it's really effective, is very subtle. It has a lot of truth to it. He's saying, be on guard. Don't believe everything you hear. Many false teachers are out in the world, and they're very effective. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus told the disciples that they would be among wolves. That's the world in which we live. We're out among wolves. Wolves in sheep's clothing, but wolves nonetheless. So they were to be, he said, shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Don't compromise your faith. Don't compromise your principles. Be innocent as a dove. Don't sin. But at the same time, be shrewd. Know the nature of the world. Don't be taken in. 
in order to be that kind of person, in order to be wise and not naive, we need to know the Word of God. And that's, it's, it's, it's as simple as that, and I suppose I could emphasize that every Sunday morning. Know the Scriptures. That's why it's important to be here where we study through the Word of God week by week, systematically, and we come eventually, over time, to all the great doctrines of the faith, and we learn them. That is essential. This book is truth, and it's the standard of orthodoxy. If you want to know what error is, you don't have to study error. Study the truth. And when you know the truth, and you hear what isn't the truth, you'll know it. Uh, Now that, I think... It needs to be said. But here, the Lord is assuring us that the elect cannot deny the faith and follow a false Christ. The Lord's sheep hear His voice and they follow Him. A stranger they will not follow. That's what Jesus said in John 10 and verse 5. That is the perseverance of the saints, or I think probably better described as the preservation of the saints. What God does, not what we do. The saints won't be fooled by people who say, Christ has come already, or identify some personality who is as the Lord. Paul told the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the day of the Lord won't happen until the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed what Christ is prophesying here. And when the Lord does return, it will be clear. It will be obvious. There will be no confusion about it. He he describes it in the next verses. It will be preceded by cosmic disruptions in the sky, says in verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Literally, stars will fall? Is that what he's saying? Yes, but not real stars. Obviously, the sun isn't going to collapse onto the earth. But meteors, which appear to be falling stars, we call them that. The Lord's return to earth will be a a spectacular event. Uh, And if you think about it, if we're talking about the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity coming again into this world, would you not expect it to be something spectacular? He says it will be. And so we would expect that. We would naturally expect uh, spectacular things, material, uh, astronomical events. That's what he's describing here. The Lord said it would happen after that tribulation. And there won't be a delay. In Matthew, he said, immediately after the tribulation, at the end, events will follow speedily at the Lord's return. And this is, not, uh, this, is, this is what he's describing here. And I, I don't think we could say this is vague in, in its revelation. This is a very precise prophecy. There are specific signs of his coming. And once they begin, the end will come quickly. The Lord's return is described in verse 26. During the display of these heavenly disruptions, the Lord will appear in the sky. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. It's at this moment that the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 will be fulfilled. Israel will see and mourn because God will pour out His Spirit on them and they will repent and believe. And so there'll be a great revival among the Jews. This is when I believe that uh, what Paul says in Romans 11 will take place. All Israel will be saved. Those Jews in the end times will become believers. Israel will repent, be saved, and, and God's people all over the world will be rescued. That's what the Lord says in verse 27. And then He will send forth the angels and will gather together His elect from the four winds, 
from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. These are not just the elect of Israel, but the elect from every nation, Jew and Gentile. The, uh, the gospel will go out and be preached, as verse 10 says, to all the nations. We, we are to be doing that now. That is the mission of the church today, to go to the four corners of the earth, preaching the gospel, making disciples. But it will be done during this period of time known as the tribulation in the future. There will be a, a great deal of evangelistic activity then, and there will be a great response of faith during that time. Missionary activity will be wide and will be intense and it will be successful. And it will be successful because those who believe are elect. That's how the Lord describes believers here. Elect. Whom he chose. And so uh, that's how he puts it in verse 20. And so to emphasize election is God's choice. People are often troubled over the doctrine of election, but it's clearly taught in the Bible. We, we see it here um, in verse 27. We see it here in verse 20. It's taught clearly throughout the Bible. Now, that's, that's indisputable if you simply look at the word here. And I think that's worth considering for a moment because it is such a troublesome doctrine to so many people. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 that God has chosen us from the beginning for salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, he wrote that God chose us before the foundation of the world. It's God's choice, and He's made it from all eternity. Now that is simply God's grace, and, and it ensures that people will believe because Election is not just to salvation, but election is God's choice of His people to be saved through faith. They are chosen to believe. The elect do that. The elect believe. That's how we know who the elect are. They're the ones who believe. So the doctrine of election does not discourage evangelism. It encourages evangelism. In fact, apart from evangelism, no one would believe. No one would be saved. Now, some people say, well, he chose us based upon foreseen faith. God looked down through time. He saw who would believe, and he chose them, which is really not God's choice. It's their choice of God. He simply ratifies it. But that cannot be the case. I've said this many times, so I'm repeating myself, I'm sure. But if you go back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul is giving this indictment on the entire human race. He's indicted the Gentiles in chapter 1 to show why we need a Savior. He does the same for the Jews in chapter 2. And then he kind of sums things up in chapter 3, and he gives a list of indictments against the entire human race. And he says... There is none who understands, and he's quoting the Psalms, by the way, so this is the testimony of the Old and the New Testament. There is none who seeks for God. None. No, not one. Now, if election is based upon God looking down through time and choosing those who would choose Him, then nobody would be chosen because it says none seeks for God. But we do seek for God because God intervenes to give us faith, to give life. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, you were born dead in your sins, unable to respond, but God being rich in mercy made you alive. He does that for those He's chosen. And so, election doesn't discourage evangelism, it opens the door to evangelism. And that should be incentive for us to be engaged in it, to give the gospel. It will be received by some and by many by the elect. And they will inherit the world to come. They will inherit the kingdom that Jesus will establish when he comes as he predicts and prophesied he would here. It is at the end of the world? Not exactly. It is the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of this present age and its chaos and rebellion. 
The Lord will return. He will inaugurate a kingdom on the earth. It will last a thousand years, according to Revelation 20 and verse 3. Then will come the eternal state when God will fold up the universe like an old garment, as the author of Hebrews describes the event, and He will make it into a new heaven and a new earth, world without end. Eternity is what is described. Well, that's the future according to the Bible. Short term, there will be trials, that's true, but immediately, or rather I should say ultimately, it is a future of hope. And a very different future from what scientists predict. Now, science is always changing, as it ought to be. New things are discovered that force people to rethink their position, positions that may have been held for a long, long time. And then we learn something, they learn something, and they have to rethink. And that's, that's not a criticism. That's the way it should be. But science is, uh, is not a firm ground of authority for that very reason. It's full of uncertainty. It's changing. For example, early in the 20th century, astronomers believed that the Milky Way galaxy was the universe. That was it. That's not that long ago people believed that. Well, that's changed. We know that's not all there is to the universe, that this galaxy is one of, what, millions or billions? It's amazing how many galaxies they've discovered. So that's changed, and so also has their understanding of the nature of the universe. Einstein believed the universe was static. It was infinite and it was eternal. I think at the end of his life he came to change in that view, but he held firmly to it for a long time. Most scientists did. It had no beginning, it will have no end. And then it was discovered, indisputably, that the universe is expanding. That changed everything. It, and it led to two different views about how things will go and how everything will end. The first theory is the expanding universe will only continue to expand. The, the distance between galaxies will increase and space will grow emptier until each galaxy will be alone. The stars will burn out and the universe will fade into cold darkness and eternal night. Or it will not expand forever. Gravity will eventually pull the, the outward moving galaxies to stop and then pull them in toward each other in, 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 at increasing speed until the universe collapses in a fiery end. Today, that second theory has been rejected for the first. The universe, it's been discovered, is it's only uh, expanding at an increasingly rapid rate. And so the view, the view now is that uh, it will continue to expand until, uh, like an old soldier, it just fades away. Either way, according to that, it's, it's coming to nothing. Not a very happy future. It's a, a hopeless eschatology. One ruled by fate or determinism if we're to believe the astronomers. But if we believe the prophets, if we believe the Lord Jesus Christ who doesn't change, the end is not darkness. It is glory and life everlasting for everyone who trusts in Him. Now, if you do trust in Him, the world, especially the materialists of this age, will dismiss you as being no different than the village idiot of the shtetl of Frampol, waiting for something that doesn't come. But, but consider them for a moment. The physicist Stephen Hawking is the Einstein of our generation. He wrote in 2014 that he doesn't believe that God is necessary to explain creation. He said, the laws of gravity and quantum theory allow universes to appear spontaneously from nothing. Now, really, 
Now, you would have to have observed something like that, I would think, to be able to say that, but this is what he has said based upon his knowledge of physics. But I think if you think about that, you can see the flaw in what he's saying. You can see the grand assumption that he's made. And others have seen that and have written in response to that. One of them wrote, and I'm quoting a scientist here, but what created the laws of physics? Where does gravity come from? The, the lack of reason, is, well, I'm pointing out here, is not with us, it's with them. George Orwell said, some ideas are so absurd that only intellectuals believe them. A modern man has his ideas. A modern man has his myths. And these things change continually. Now listen, I'm not attacking science. I don't want to be understood as doing that. Pure science is good. It's not the enemy of the church. It's, uh, it's a blessing. We learn things, and we advance in pro uh, the progress of mankind advances for the better through science. And scientists, physicists, Stephen Hawking, they're, they're smart people, brilliant people. But some try to explain things that they can't explain from their limited field. There is nothing illogical in believing that God is. Nothing illogical in believing that he created everything. Nothing illogical in believing that since he exists, he has a plan for his universe, and that he would reveal that plan to us. It's not illogical. It's not irrational. So there's nothing quixotic or unrealistic about the promise of the Lord's return. Don't doubt it. And don't let the world with its hopeless eschatology rob you of God's good promises. Everything is happen happening just as Jesus said it would and it will happen just as he said it will happen. Now that's faith for sure, but it's faith in God's rock solid word. Faith in divine revelation, not human reason. It is revelation, it is the Bible that gives real hope. And I would say reasonable, rational hope for a world that has no hope. Christ is coming again. He will defeat evil and establish a domain of righteousness throughout this earth. That's God's plan. And he's working everything toward it. And the one who endures to the end, Jesus said, will be saved. And, and there's a corollary to all of this. If God is guiding the present into the future and, and for the future, then he's in control of the present. We're being governed constantly, right now, every day, every moment of your life, by his almighty providence. Life is not accidental. It's not ruled by chance. We are not trapped in a universe that's like some giant machine grinding inevitably toward oblivion. There is meaning to life. There is a goal to history. Therefore, we can live confidently today. We can live without fear or anxiety about the present or about what is to come. Just live daily in obedience to the Lord, living by faith in Him, trusting Him moment by moment as we live out our life. He's in control. If that were not so, if we all were at the mercy of fate or random material forces, then we could have absolutely no confidence to even step outside the house at any moment of the day where anything could happen. We can't take a step, or we couldn't if this was our belief, without fear of being run over by something or uh, touching something, without fear of 
contracting a microbe or uh, taking a breath of air without fear of inhaling a virus. Life for a materialist is full of uncertainty. In fact, they have no ground for any certainty. Life for someone who is purely a materialist is a nightmare. The world is a dangerous place, but we know God's in control of it, guiding our steps so we can live confidently that all things work together for our good and for His glory. So we're to live for Him and we're to live for His glory confidently. The world may write you off as, uh, as unenlightened, as a village idiot, but you're in good company if it does, because that's what the world did with the apostles. Paul spoke of that in, in 1 Corinthians 4. He said, we are slandered. He's talking about the apostles. And he said, we're, he said, we're the scum of the world. Those are the words that he used. Fools for Christ, he said. That's the world's assessment of the apostles. Who's the fool? Someday he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. And every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That is a certainty. Are you ready for that? You are if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you are... Be steadfast. That's what the Lord is telling us. Be working presently. Be diligent. Be serving one another. Wherever you can. He's coming again. And it may not be long. That should serve as an alarm to all of us. Redeem the time. And for you who are here who perhaps have not believed in Christ. Don't delay. Trust in Christ. He is God's eternal Son who became a man in order to offer Himself up as a sacrifice for sinner. The sinner is the only sacrifice that removes sin and guilt and removes it as far as the east is from the west. So believe in Him. He forgives everyone who comes to Him. He receives all who come and believe. Trust in Him and receive eternal life. And then live for Him. Serve Him. May God help you to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. And one of the good things You have given to us is revelation of the future. We don't have all the details of it, but we have the general sweep of it. And what it tells us is, eventually, You will triumph your Son will come and establish His kingdom. And that is eternal. May we live for that. May we live for You and serve You faithfully in all that we do. We thank You for Christ. We thank You for His first coming where He offered Himself up as a sacrifice. And we thank You for that sacrifice and the life we have in Him and through it. It's in His name we pray. Amen.